Moscow's cookbook and speakeasy with Chef Justice Putnam. Netroomsradio.com Je voudrais du soleil vert, des dentelles et des TR, des photos de bord de mer, de mon jardin d'hiver. Je voudrais de la lumière, comme en Nouvelle-Angleterre. Je veux changer d'atmosphère, de mon jardin d'hiver. Probably the most important, one of the most important election of, uh, I, I think, my lifetime. Yeah, I agree. Coming, coming up, you and I, uh, both uh, former Republicans, you and I, uh, both uh, uh, conservative and actually conservative. Yeah, like real ones. Not radicals, conservatives. You and I, both conservatives. Our party just keeps getting worse. They're screwing over the military in the Senate. They're attacking, eviscerating, uh, uh, besmirching military leaders in the House, the Republicans are. Uh, it seems like a full-scale attack against the military, a full-scale attack against law enforcement. If you're a Capitol Hill cop, a full-scale attack against law enforcement. If you're in the FBI, a full-scale attack against the rule of law. Whatever it is, like all the things that my parents drove my parents from the Democratic Party to the Republican right. Party in the late 1960s when Democrats were trying to tear, radicals were trying to tear down institutions. We've just done a complete U-turn. And now it's Republicans that are trying down to tear down institutions. And as I always say, I do the Burke quote, uh, the, the founder of, uh, of, of conservatism who said, institutions that are built up in a thousand years right. can be torn down in a day. Yeah. And that's what Donald Trump wants to do. And it's what he and it, it, it's what Steve Bannon said from the beginning. I'm a Leninist. I want to destroy the government. What is it the Republicans stand for now? I mean, I, I ask myself that. OK, people say, well, they're for fiscal responsibility. Well, I was in Congress and we spent a lot of money. OK, uh, people can say, well, they're for a strong national defense. OK, well, about half the party right now doesn't want to support Ukraine. About a quarter of the party, you know, most of the party right now is saying, uh, hey, let's let's support Israel in this. But I want to we have to do it at the cost of the IRS. Why? Right. Because I can go on uh, a certain news channel and go after the IRS, which everybody hates. And so that's actually good for fundraising. Really, it all boils down to like it's great for fundraising and great for outrage. And in the book, I mean, that's what I talk about is just watching for t you got to watch a few years before I came in and I got to watch the years after you left and on and just now I can look back and be like, oh, there were all these signs that we were going to become a party unmoored to any principle. And it was all just about outrage and fundraising. And, and what conservatism has become is no longer principles. Conservatism has become, can you be offensive? Can you be the one that's the most radical? The one party at the, the one table at the Lincoln Day dinner with the weirdos, the next year becomes like everybody at the Lincoln Day exactly. dinner and what they believe. By the way, there, by the way, there always was that table. <laughs> that is true. And you would, that sh you would shake hands with Main Street Republicans. You would walk past the table of weirdos you go, how you doing? Hey, Thanks yeah. so much for you. And you would keep walking and, and, and talking to people who were <laughs> who believed in balancing the budget. Yes. And supporting Israel and pushing back on Russia and all those very weird things uh, that 
we Republicans used to believe. So, Congressman, let's get your take on the new Speaker of the House, someone you served with. Yeah. Uh, someone who, going? at the moment, you know, has Israel aid, but with conditions and offsets and going to raise the deficit. Someone who, at least to this point, has not been willing to support funding for Ukraine. And someone who was one of the leaders in efforts to overturn Joe Biden's election. Yeah, I was going to say, he's just a well-dressed, he's a well-dressed insurrectionist. I mean, my, my interaction with Mike Johnson, I had a few, didn't know him well, because nobody knew him, actually. But he came to me with like his little clipboard one time and was asking me if I would sign on to this amicus brief to a Texas lawsuit throwing out other states' election results, right? This is the thing that in December. And I, I remember I, I was just looked at him, I'm like, Mike, I mean, you know who I am. You know what I've been saying, right? Like, there's no way I'm going to sign on to this. And he kind of like scurries away with it. And I remember thinking, like, nobody's going to sign on to that, of course. Well, almost 100 did, right. including, by the way, Kevin McCarthy, who told Liz Cheney that there's no way he's going to sign on to that. I'm like, like I'm, uh, come on, I'm not going to sign on to that. The next morning, the list of people that signed on to this Mike Johnson attempt to overturn the election came out. Kevin McCarthy wasn't on it. He put out a statement that said his name was inadvertently left off. And then he was added onto it. That goes to show what kind of a man Kevin McCarthy is. Yeah. Mike Johnson's just the guy that was leading what Kevin McCarthy was. Can I say the split screen, though, of, of Jenna Ellis tearfully admitting of lying to the American people in court? And apologizing. And, at the, and apologizing. And at the same time, the base entry to be considered as a speaker candidate for the GOP was you had to be still lying about the election. Can I say that split screen and how much that shows? that the GOP doesn't mind lying to its voters Can we also remind everybody about his very progressive stances on LGBTQ as far as everything oh, yeah. that, that basically uh, he so wrote an op-ed piece in 2005 basically saying that, that if you're gay, it's against the law, it's going to lead to pedophilia, it's going to lead to you marrying your pets. This is, this is the most powerful Republican, and this is who they elected. So, Congressman, let's get the view from the inside. You watched this all happen. Oh, yeah. On the 2020 election, you and Liz Cheney were pretty lonely in that Republican caucus. Let's look ahead now to next year's election. You've got a guy who led the legal effort to overturn the election. He's now the Speaker of the House. You've got an entire caucus, as you say, who the litmus test is. Are you on board with yeah. overturning the election? If it's yes, okay, you're good with us. What should we expect next fall? You should expect pure fear right now in the GOP to act. You'll be lucky if the government stays open. You'll be lucky if you get these aid bills done. Okay. What do you expect next year? What do I expect next year? I actually expect the Republicans are going to get crushed um, because the American people know they're lying to them. I mean, even if they're too scared to say it, they know it. But I'll say this. I think the most important thing the Democratic Party can do right now, and frankly, the independents, is say there's only one issue on the ballot in my mind. The only issue is does democracy survive or doesn't it? You know, Joe had said earlier this is the most important election. Every election you hear that, this is different because I truly think the guardrails of democracy held once. I don't think they can hold against the same impact. And if Donald Trump wins, which is possible, everybody, he could win. Yeah. Um, he's oh, yes. only going to put people around him that say, like, I don't actually care about the Constitution. I'm going to swear an allegiance to you. So I think it's going to be an intense year. It's going to be a pretty bad year, to be honest. But do you think Democrats are going to win? I don't know. I mean, yes, I, I think if it's today, because I still believe in the faith of democracy that 50 plus 1 percent of people can see through this. But they, the problem is my Democratic friends are taking it for granted. When I say be worried about Donald Trump, a lot of times they scoff at me like, oh, uh, like, no, be yeah. worried about Donald Trump because he could win this thing. It is Friday, the 3rd of November of 2023. And you are in West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy. I am your chef de cuisine, Justice Putnam. Gunner the English Bulldog is our snoozing sous chef. Precious the Little Yorkie is our door girl, and she will be seating you directly for our especially special daily special, Blue Moon Spirits Fridays, because we are all Nighthawks in the Diner of Life. Oh, my. Okay, so uh, had a few uh, a few imbroglios yesterday in the various Trump trials and tribulations. He goes through them all, and he causes a few as well. That's the way they work. Yeah, it looks looks like Don Jr. Uh, might be criminally indicted from what he gave up. Uh, 
on the stand, though he seemed to be so nice about it. Whereas Eric was a rather taciturn fellow. Pouring concrete. That's all he ever did. I pour concrete. I don't know anything about the business. He doesn't even know how to pour concrete. Give me a break. This guy's never poured concrete in his life. Oh, my God. You know, I wouldn't let this guy on a job site, to be honest with you. It looks like an accident waiting to happen. Could you imagine Eric tying off rebar on a form? I don't think so. That'd be funny to see. But that's not the type. You know, he's mistaking putting his handprint into wet cement as pouring concrete. Okay. Yeah, I went to a ribbon cutting and I put my hands in wet cement. I pour concrete. All right. And I got to tell you, the MAGA faithful just lap it up. They're being so persecuted. If they go after the Trumps, they could go after us. Well, I sure hope so. (laughs) You know, I wish. I wish we could, but we won't. Because for some reason, we're going to treat them like, oh, they're just neighbors. Yeah, well, you know, they were just neighbors in the 1860s, the very early part. And even before. There was a lot of stuff going on before... The Civil War. Mm -hmm. All right. And they're back. (laughs) They are back. I saw a uh, blurb on social media that apparently an Apple employee who um, uh, touted her proud, being a proud German. I'm a proud German. Essentially, what she was doing was blaming the Jews for everything happening in the world. That they invade the countries and they take the jobs and you know all the old Nazi tropes about the Jews. And she got fired. Apple fired her for the anti-Semitic uh, statements that she had proclaimed. And good. Now, the right wing is all up in arms saying she's being canceled. Damn right she is. There's no place for this BS in America. I don't care if you're from Germany or not. Proud German. Give me a break. So, and then, on the heels of that, uh, I see this uh, this uh, survey or, or a poll or a, a research, a research paper that found... That if it wasn't for white people, Donald Trump would not have won the election. White people, by and large, voted for Donald Trump. And, of course, you know, I could go out there and say, well, I didn't vote for him. But you know what? White people voted for Trump. And if it wasn't for vast numbers of white people voting for Trump, we wouldn't be in the position we are now. Let us be clear about that. So, but there's a lot of people out there right now going, no, not all white people. Well, yeah. Does that need to be said? (laughs) Do you need to say it? (laughs) Give me a break. I think it's up to us, meaning some of us white people, not all of us, (laughs) because not all of us are white. (laughs) But I think it is up to we white people to uh, you maybe get on the case of our, 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 I don't know, other white people. Get on their case. I know I do. Um, it's kind of funny being in that tenuous position of, uh, you know, being called a commie, a threat to uh, America. I'm the threat because I do not believe in fascism. It, it's, it's quite hilarious still. Uh, where people just write off, right off the top, as if there's nothing wrong with it, saying, oh, well, you know, if Antifa wasn't, uh, you know, being so Antifa, you know, we we wouldn't have to do these things. Really? <laughs> Are you just going to come right out and say it? There's another uh, research paper that came out that shows, uh, actually, it's, it's a frightening survey. And uh, we'll have a clip of it from the American Democracy Minute uh, in which 
a vast amount of Americans believe that political violence is just a okay. It's not just MAGA Republicans, but Republicans as a whole believe it's just a okay to use political violence. And now it's starting to seep in over on our side. I got to tell you, when I say punch the Nazis, I don't mean actually going out door to door and punching Nazis. That's what they would do. Go to door to door and pull out you and I don't know, slap a, a star David on you and uh, take you to the camps. When I say punch the Nazis, I'm talking about like firing an Apple employee who who touts herself as being a proud German. And it's the Jews that have been doing all the bad things in the world. And we, you know, so they should expect to have some sort of reprisal. What? So I'm not, I am not saying let's go out and actually punch people. No, it might be necessary. You know, but I like the idea of maybe punching back in terms of protection. You know, who you you could be nonviolent and and not allow someone to hit you across the head with a baseball bat. Oh, if I defend myself from this baseball bat, then I'm no longer nonviolent. No, Martin Luther King never said anything that it was okay to get hit over the head with a baseball bat. Save yourself. The idea is that, you know, when the old baseball bat comes at you, you don't take it out of their hand and beat them with it. Okay, you don't do that. Ah, Please. So that's a very, as democracy, American Democracy Minute stated, a very frightening prospect. Political violence in America is okay. We don't need a peaceful transition of power anymore. That's not expected. (laughs) <laughs> how quickly we've changed. And it's from people who have no idea what has gone on in the United States since before we began, who now want to tell our kids they can't learn about it because it might make them feel bad when they find out their ancestors, somebody they might be related to, did these things. We can't let them, people know about it. It'll hurt them. And then they whine at us for being, I don't know, soft belly, whatever. Oh, you guys are so soft, are we? <laughs> God. They, you know, it's, I got to tell you, generally we don't need to, you know, strut around reminding everybody about how, you know, great and, uh, I don't know, formidable we are. We don't need to do that. Strong and silent wins the day. Okay. So much for all of those tropes. What do we have in store for you for the rest of the show here? In this salon that we call West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy. Well, yes, MAGA Mike Johnson is just a dapper insurrectionist. Just well-dressed. Mm-hmm. Has some uh, very very fine southern charm. That's how they that's how they uh, suck you in into their I don't know <laughs> fascism. That's it. On the rest of the menu, two women intend to sue the city of Portland, Oregon, after Portland police drove into their car and held them at gunpoint by mistake. Indiana's Attorney General violated professional conduct rules in statements he made about a doctor who provided an abortion to a 10-year-old rape victim from Ohio. Remember that? He finally got his comeuppance. And a Minnesota appeals court ruled to protect felons' voting rights after finding a lower court judge overstepped. After the break, we move to the chef's table, where Putin signed a bill revoking Russia's ratification of the Global Nuclear Test Ban Treaty. And he says to put us or to put his country on par with ours. Oh, really? Well, we could do something about that. Maybe sign the treaty. We could. And police in Bangladesh's capital use tear gas and stun grenades 
to disperse more than a thousand garment factory workers who took to the streets for a sixth straight day to demand better wages. All that and more on West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy. Bon Appetit. Radio.com to the right of the page is the chat room link, and the chat room is monitored by Kelly Lincoln. And thank you, Kelly, for doing so and everything else. Thank you. Across the page to the left from that chat room link near the bottom of our homepage at netroosradio.com, and just a skosh, down just a skosh. From that chat room link to the left is the link to our Patreon page. And if you could become a recurring Patreon of Netroots Radio, and if you could afford to send us what you might spend on an espresso-type coffee drink once a month, if you could send those funds to us once a month, we'll pull those funds with other like-minded folk. And that puts a big dent in the bills and other costs that are accrued running this powerhouse of resistance. So we thank you for your generosity in allowing us to fulfill our civic duty as the founders originally intended so many, many years ago. If you would like to follow Netroots Radio on Twitter, Mastodon, Spoutable, Blue Sky, even on Facebook, you can do so at Netroots Radio. Tom takes care of those, and we thank Tom for doing so, and everything else as well. Follow me on Twitter, Mastodon, Spoutable, Blue Sky, Instagram, Tumblr, Facebook, yadda yadda yeah. <laughs> you can find me on almost all of them at Justice Putnam, and a few of them simply as Justice Putnam. Now, I post the show notes and links diary on Daily Co's 10 minutes before showtime. And if you were to follow my social media feeds, the links to those diaries are right there. So they're pretty easy to find. And that's where the real reportage can be found that inspires us each and every day for our daily specials. Isn't that grand? <laughs> yeah. Anyway, if you would like to read the full article, and I would uh, suggest you do. You can find them uh, by going through my social media feed and then looking for the appropriate diary that you'd like to read the article from. There it is. You can also follow the show on Twitter. As I'll just remind you, it's only a place, Matt. I apologize. I'll get more active with it on, uh, on the other platforms. But on Twitter right now, you can find the show at Cookbook West and pick up podcasts by way of Spreaker, TuneIn, iHeart, YouTube, iTunes. You know, wherever you can find podcasts, you'll just never find them on Stitcher. Not anymore. Nope, you won't. Okay, it's Friday. Fall back Friday. That's right. Supposedly we gain an hour, do we? I don't know. Anyway... It is fallback uh, weekend, and you know what to do about 2 a.m. on Sunday morning. Usually I do it at 11, so I don't have to get up at 2, you know, like everybody else does. But here it is, another another change of time. That's right. All right. This first offering here in the Bistro Cafe part of West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy is by Catalina Gaetan of the Oregonian. The two women who intend to sue the city of Portland after they say Portland police officers drove into their car and held them at gunpoint by mistake 
have hired Portland attorney Michael Cox, who notified Portland Mayor Ted Wheeler, the city's Bureau of Emergency Communications, and the city attorney on the 30th of October of the women's intent to sue for civil rights violations, negligence, assault, and battery. The Portland Police Bureau referred questions to the city attorney's office, which declined to comment. Of course they would. Colleen McDonald, age 31, and Hillary Rossio, age 30, said they were returning to Portland from a day trip to the Columbia River Gorge about 8.45 p.m. on August 29th when Portland police officers drove a police car into McDonald's Silver 2012 Ford Fusion without warning. McDonald's car spun around before it was struck by a second police vehicle. That's when, all of a sudden, their headlights and police lights all turned on and at least seven police officers were surrounding our car screaming, Get your effing hands up, Rosario told the Oregonian. Some of the officers pointed their guns at the women who said they remained in the car in pain and too afraid to move. We were just yelling, you've got the wrong people, Rocio said. About two minutes later, Rocio said she heard an officer say, I think we might have the wrong people. The officers lowered their guns and the women exited the damaged car. McDonald crawling over the center console to get out through the passenger side door as the driver's side door was blocked by a police vehicle. An officer who sat with them while they waited for a sergeant to arrive on the scene said he had never seen a similar incident in his 28 years in the Bureau, Rocio said. The officers had mistaken McDonald's Ford Fusion for a silver car that had sped past the women earlier that night, dangerously weaving through traffic in the westbound lanes of Interstate 84, the women said. An officer told McDonald and Rocio the other car was being driven by a man who had evaded police twice so far that night and that the officers had been confused when they spotted McDonald's car driving the speed limit. (laughs) You drive the speed limit, that's probable cause to get pulled over because you might be doing something wrong. Why are you obeying the law? McDonald and Rocio asked police if the suspect's car was similar to McDonald's, and the officer said they weren't sure. And that was the in the tort claim notice. Rocio said she had neck pain that night and went to an emergency room where doctors gave her anxiety medication and muscle relaxants and referred her to a physical therapist. McDonald, who had pain in her neck and lower back, She could barely walk the next day, she said. She isn't sure if police ever found the man they were looking for. An auto repair shop told McDonald it would cost almost $5,000 to repair her car. Rocio and McDonald are seeking to have their expenses from the incident covered. The tort claim notice also states the women will ask for punitive damages from the city. Now, Cox's tort claim notice asserted there is a crisis of competence in the Portland Police Bureau, citing four other incidents since September of 2020 in which officers have mistaken someone for a crime suspect, including the fatal shooting of Emmanuel Clark Johnson in November of 2022, as Clark Johnson, age 30, ran from police on November 14th in southeast Portland, Officer Christopher Satoff shot him in the back with an AR-15, killing him. Police had mistaken Clark Johnson, who was unarmed, for an armed robbery suspect. A Multnomah County Grand Jury in August concluded, "Eh, well, Satoff was justified in fatally shooting the kid in the back. Given the numerous incidents of harm to innocent people resulting from misidentification, one must rightly ask, what was done 
After each incident to prevent further incidents, lawyer Cox wrote in his tort claim notice, nothing has been done to address the ongoing problem. Bella Volmert of the Associated Press brings us this next offering here in the Bistro Cafe of West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy, Blue Moon Spirits Fridays. Indiana's Attorney General violated professional conduct rules in statements he made about a doctor who provided an abortion to a 10-year-old rape victim from Ohio in the weeks after the Supreme Court overturned Roe v. Wade last summer, according to a court opinion filed yesterday Thursday. The case sparked national attention after Dr. Caitlin Bernard discussed providing the 10-year-old girl with a medication-induced abortion during a July 1, 2022 interview with the Indianapolis Star. At the time, Ohio law prohibited abortions after six weeks of pregnancy, but the girl could still be provided a legal abortion in Indiana. The Indiana Supreme Court's Disciplinary Commission found Todd Rokita, a Republican who opposes abortion, engaged in attorney misconduct during an interview he gave on a Fox show in July of 2022 about Bernard, an Indianapolis obstetrician gynecologist. The opinion specifically faulted Rokita for describing Bernard on the show as an abortion activist acting as a doctor with a history of failing to report instances of abuse. The opinion said Rokita violated two rules of professional conduct by making an extrajudicial statement that had a substantial likelihood of being materially prejudiced in an adjudicated proceeding and had no substantial purpose other than to embarrass or burden the physician. Rokita admitted to the two violations, and the commission dismissed a third charge, according to the opinion. The court issued a public reprimand, and find Rokita a whopping 250 bucks. That's right, $250. The initial complaint filed in September also alleged that Rokita violated confidentiality requirements by making statements about an investigation into Bernard prior to filing a complaint with the state's medical licensing board. That charge was dismissed. Now, Rokita denied violating confidentiality in a written statement responding to the court's opinion. In a statement, Rokita said he signed an affidavit to bring the proceedings to a close and to save a lot of taxpayer money and distraction. He also repeated his description of Bernard as an abortion activist. It's not clear whether the opinion chastising Rokita was limited to his claim that Bernard had a history of failing to report instances of abuse, the Associated Press left a voicemail with Bernard's attorney on Thursday yesterday. Two of the court's five justices dissented in the opinion, believing the discipline was too lenient, giving Rokita's position the scope and breadth of the admitted misconduct. Rebecca Gibron, CEO of the Planned Parenthood division that includes Indiana, said the reprimand was not enough. We are here for the people of Indiana no matter what, Gibron said in a written statement. And we are proud of Dr. Bernard and the many other providers for putting patients first, despite the hostile and dangerous environment that Rokita and anti-abortion extremists in this state have created. 
Within weeks of Bernard's July 2022 interview about providing the abortion, Indiana became the first state to approve abortion restrictions after the U.S. Supreme Court ended constitutional protections. Bernard was reprimanded by Indiana's Medical Licensing Board in May, saying she didn't abide by privacy laws by speaking publicly about the girl's treatment. Hospital system officials argued against that decision. The medical board rejected allegations that she failed to properly report suspected child abuse. Rokita separately filed a federal lawsuit against her employer, Indiana University Health, in September, claiming the hospital system violated patient privacy laws when Bernard publicly shared the girl's story. That lawsuit is still pending. Gerson Fuentes, age 28, who confessed to raping and impregnating the Ohio girl, was sentenced to life in prison in July. Cafe of West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy. A Minnesota appeals court yesterday, Thursday, stepped in to protect voting rights, recently granted to felons under a new law, undoing a judge's effort to strip two convicts of their right to vote. The Minnesota Court of Appeals found Millie Lacks County District Judge Matthew Quinn had no authority to find the new law unconstitutional. The law, which took effect in July, says people with felony convictions regain their right to vote after they completed any prison term. Quinn had said the law was unconstitutional in a pair of October orders in which he sentenced two offenders to probation, but warned them they are not eligible to vote or register to vote even though the law says they are. It was an unusual step because nobody involved in those cases ever asked him to rule on the constitutionality of the law. In his orders, Quinn concluded the legislature's passage of the law did not constitute the kind of affirmative act he said was needed to properly restore a felon's civil rights. So he said he now has a duty going forward to independently evaluate the voting capacity of felons when they complete probation. Quinn, a member of Shocking, the Federalist Society, was reprimanded by the Minnesota Board on Judicial Standards two years ago for his public support of Trump and his critical comments about President Joe Biden. Shocking. All right, let us now go to our break. And when we get back from that break, we will go through weather from around the world. And we will finish up with the stories that we've curated for you today. You are listening to West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy. And we will be right back. You are listening to NetworksRadio.com. Please hang up and try again. From a point at sea to the circles of your mind, a new force is at work for planetary transformation. New radio for a new earth. (laughs) 
This is Take Two Movie Review. I'm Kim Lowe. This week, The Killing Moon. The term masterpiece is so overused that it's almost lost all meaning, but the killers of the flower moon actually lives up to the word. Directed by master storyteller Martin Scorsese and based on the true crime bestseller, it stars Scorsese favorites Robert De Niro and Leonardo DiCaprio and transports you to the 1920s. It tells the true story of a string of murders involving the Osage people in Oklahoma who, after oil was discovered on their land, became the richest people per capita on earth. Unlike the book, which is set up as a whodunit, the audience knows right away that William Hale, played by De Niro, and his nephew, Ernest, DiCaprio's character, are behind the murders. The motive is getting their hands on native oil rights. Aware that the only way to do that is via blood or marriage, William enlists Ernest to marry into a target family and slowly arrange for the demise of each member with the intent of leaving Ernest as the heir. While the who, what, and why of William is established early, Ernest's motives are far more nuanced, and it's DiCaprio's performance, along with that of his on-screen wife, Molly, played astonishingly by Lily Gladstone, that drives this one. In what's likely to become a multi-award-nominated performance, Gladstone portrays Molly as a realistic, intelligent woman who knows from the beginning that Ernest is more interested in her money than her. However, the relationship becomes increasingly complex, especially once the pair start a family. Add to this nuanced web, spectacular cinematography, and the incredible production design of Jack Fisk, and The Killers of the Flower Moon isn't just one of the best movies of the year, it may be one of the best movies ever made. This has been Take Two Movie Review. I'm Kim Lowe. Catch up with us at TakeTwoMovieReview.com and feed us back on our channel on YouTube. This program is presented by the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. For older adults, optimal aging includes preventing injuries, effectively managing existing chronic conditions, and maintaining physical and cognitive health and social engagement. I'm Dr. Linda Anderson, Director of CDC's Healthy Aging Program. The promotion of cognitive health is a critical component of overall good health. Cognitive health among older adults is not just the absence of disease. It's the development and preservation of cognitive abilities such as memory, language, judgment, and remembered skills such as driving. Cognitive abilities enable individuals to maintain social connectedness, an ongoing sense of purpose, and the ability to function independently. In 2013, CDC and the Alzheimer's Association released the second in a series of roadmaps. This roadmap, the Public Health Roadmap for State and National Partnerships 2013 to 2018, was developed as part of CDC's Healthy Brain Initiative. It reflects the insights and expertise of a wide range of stakeholders at the national, state, and community levels. The roadmap shares the Healthy Brain Initiative's vision of cognitive health as a vital component of overall health and well-being, an area ripe for public health efforts. Specific actions are addressed in four traditional domains of public health. The first is monitor and evaluate. Tracking the health of the nation is a fundamental public health function. Actions in this area include assessments related to cognitive health that help quantify and qualify the public health impact and inform public health policies and strategies. The second domain is Educate and Empower the Nation, which focuses on actions that raise public awareness and improve access to information and resources. The third domain, Develop Policy and Mobilize Partnerships, includes actions aimed at ensuring that cognitive health is integrated into a broad spectrum of public health work. The fourth area, Assure a Competent Workforce, focuses on preparing public health professionals to translate current and emerging findings on cognitive health into effective public health practice. This roadmap provides a solid foundation for the public health community to anticipate and respond as new scientific discoveries related to cognitive health emerge. Public health agencies and partners are encouraged to work together on actions that best fit their mission, needs, interests, and capabilities. For more information, please visit 
cdc.gov slash aging slash healthy brain. For the most accurate health information, visit www.cdc.gov or call 1-800-CDC-INFO. Wake up and text. Text and eat. Mm -mm. Text and catch the bus. Text and miss your stop. Wait, 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 wait. Text and be late to work. Sorry, I'm late. Text and work. Text and pretend to work. Text and act surprised when someone calls you out for not working. <clears throat> Who, me? Text and meet up with a friend you haven't seen in forever. Hi. Oh, hey. Text and complain that they're on their phone the whole time. <sighs> Text and listen to them complain that you're on your phone the whole time. Ugh. Text and whatever. But when you get behind the wheel, give your phone to a passenger. Put it in the glove box. Just don't text and drive. Visit StopTextsStopRex.org. A public service announcement brought to you by the National Highway Traffic Safety Administration and the Ad Council. He seems sorry. We very clearly told him not to look up there. I'm honestly impressed that he was able to do it. Right? What did he balance on that big chair? Yeah, I mean, I guess he'll just know what his gifts are this year. I really thought we had hidden them well. If they can find their presence, they can find a gun. 911, what is your emergency? Every day, eight kids and teens are unintentionally killed or injured by loaded and unlocked guns. Learn how to make your home safer at nfamilyfire.org. Brought to you by the Ad Council and Family Fire. Hi, I'm Tom Harbin, and since you're listening to NetrootsRadio.com, show your progressive side and go to the Donate button on the bottom of the homepage. It's progressives like you who power Netroots Radio and keep the progressive message beaming everywhere 24 hours a day. Just go to our Donate button at the bottom of NetrootsRadio.com. Thank you for keeping progressive radio at full power. You're listening to the American Democracy Minute, keeping your government by and for the people. A frightening survey released last week found substantial increases in the number of Americans who thought the country needed leaders to break rules, authoritarianism, and that violence may be needed to, quote, save our country. The majority of Americans still disagree with those positions, according to the survey conducted by the Public Religion Research Institute and the Brookings Institution. But 23% of Americans agreed with the statement, because things have gotten so far off track, true American patriots may have to resort to violence in order to save our country. That's up 8% from 2021. The increase is among all partisan groups, too, including 33% of Republicans, 22% of Independents, and 13% of Democrats. The survey also found a disturbing trend of Americans supporting a leader not following the rules if it meant a change in political direction of the country. Four in ten Americans agree with the statement, because things have gotten so far off track in this country, we need a leader who is willing to break some rules if that's what it takes to set things right. This bent toward authoritarian rule is not just among the 48% of Republicans who agreed, 38% of independents and 29% of Democrats concurred. Where do most Americans agree? 77% of Americans feel their country is headed in the wrong direction. We have a link to the full survey results at AmericanDemocracyMinute.org. I'm Brian Beal. I'm Rick Smith, and this is Labor History in Two. On this day in labor history, the year was 1979. That was the day that became known as the Greensboro Massacre. Members of the Ku Klux Klan and the American Nazi Party shot and killed five participants in a demonstration held by the Workers' Viewpoint Organization, later called the Communist Workers' Party. Workers' Viewpoint organizers had come to Greensboro in an effort to strengthen the unions at the Cone Mills textile plants. At the time, Cone Mills was the largest producer of denim in the world. African-American mill workers faced discrimination and dangerous conditions, including breathing in textile dust that was known to potentially cause brown lung disease. Tensions between the communist organizers and the Ku Klux Klan began to mount. Disagreements also arose between the communists and other union organizing efforts in Greensboro. The Workers' Viewpoint Group decided to hold a Smash the Klan demonstration. They coordinated 
initiated the route of the march with the local police. But on that fateful day, no police were there to provide protection. In broad daylight, cars filled with Klansmen and Nazi members drove up and opened fire on the demonstrators. Five people fell dead. A criminal trial was held in 1980, and a federal civil rights trial took place in 1984. Both times, the defendants were acquitted by all white juries. In 2004, Greensboro began a Truth and Reconciliation Commission to address their community history. The second chapter of the final report recounts how Milano Cottle, the Nazi who owned one of the vehicles driven that day, later bragged in an interview that the Klan destroyed the damn Union with its actions against the marchers. After the tragedy, there was a strong backlash in the press against the communist organizers. Like what you hear? Check out more at laborhistoryin2.com. Thank you for accompanying us here to the chef's table at West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy Blue Moon Spirits Fridays because we are all Nighthawks in the Diner of Life. We always begin weather from around the world along the banks of the Rogue River. In the Rogue River Valley of Southern Oregon on the west coast of the continental United States of America, where it is currently 58 degrees Fahrenheit, expecting highs just about 70 degrees, so a bit warmer than yesterday. Foggy conditions currently with cloudy skies later. Rain showers off and on throughout the day, and winds will be light and variable. Then considerable cloudiness uh, with an occasional rain shower this evening, and then much heavier rain overnight. Lows in the mid-50s, winds light and variable. And then heavy rainfall tomorrow, Saturday. And uh, highs will be in the low 60s, winds light and variable. Looks like we're going to get over half an inch of rain for Saturday and three quarters of an inch on Sunday. More rain through Tuesday, and then it looks like Wednesday might taper off some with only a few rain showers, and then picking up again on Thursday for the rest of the week into the into next weekend. So I guess we're in the El Nino rainy season. A little bit warmer than what we like. Fortunately at elevation things are freezing. We just don't want them to melt off. Okay. Ragweed pollen is back on the register, and it is registering low here in our little town of Rogue River. The air quality index for the region is in the good range at 27 parts per million, and the daytime UV index is low at level 2. Barometric pressure is falling at 30.16 inches. Visibility is down to 1 mile and relative humidity is at 97%. Weather from around the world is brought to you by a crowd of crowdsourced weather stations that a crowd crowdsources from around the world, and that is the weather underground. London is 56 degrees with light rain, though they have an advisory for heavy rain. Paris is 50 degrees and cloudy, and they have an advisory for rain and flash flooding. Rome is 65 degrees with rain, and they have an advisory for thunderstorms. Bagram is 51 and clear. Kiev is 50 degrees and mostly cloudy. Beijing is 77 and fair. Tokyo is 62 degrees and clear. Melbourne, Victoria, Australia is 55 and mostly cloudy. San Francisco, California is 60 degrees and sunny. Chicago, Illinois is 48 degrees and partly cloudy. And New York, New York is 52 degrees Fahrenheit and fair. And that is weather from around the world. 
brought to you by a crowd of crowdsourced weather stations that a crowd crowdsources from around the world. Associated Press World Desk brings us this first amuse bouche here at the chef's table at West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy Blue Moon Spirits Fridays. Vladimir Putin yesterday, Thursday, signed a bill revoking Russia's ratification of a global nuclear test ban, a move that Moscow said was needed to establish parity with the United States. Putin has said that rescinding the ratification of the Comprehensive Nuclear Test Ban Treaty, also known as the CTBT, would mirror the stand taken by the U.S., which has signed but not ratified the nuclear test ban. And who has been responsible for that? I'm looking at you, MAGA. Both houses of the Russian parliament voted last month to to revoke Moscow's ratification of the bill, the CTBT, adopted in 1996, bans all nuclear explosions anywhere in the world, but the treaty was never fully implemented. In addition to the U.S., it has yet to be ratified by China, India, Pakistan, North Korea, Israel, Iran, and Egypt. There are widespread concerns that Russia may resume tests to try to discourage the West from continuing any military support to Ukraine. Many Russian hawks have spoken in favor of resumption of the nuclear tests. U.S. Secretary of State Antony Blinken said that Russia's move represents a significant step in the wrong direction, taking us further from not closer to entry into force. Russia's action will only serve to set back confidence in the international arms control regime. Putin has noted that some experts argue for the necessity of conducting nuclear tests, but said he had not formed an opinion on the issue. Russian Deputy Foreign Minister Sergei Rabakov said last month that Moscow would continue to respect the ban and will only resume nuclear tests if Washington does so first. Je te donne ce mon amour pour la vie entière La promesse de me trouver à tes genoux Aussitôt que tu m'appelles Rester toujours fidèle, c'est tout, c'est tout. Je te donne tous mes printemps, mes étés de mer, mes automnes quand les feuilles tombent partout. Si ce n'est pas une bonne affaire, je te donne tous mes hivers. More staff at the World Desk of the Associated Press brings us this final amuse-bouche here at the chef's table at West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy. Police in Bangladesh's capital yesterday, Thursday, used tear gas and stun grenades to disperse more than 1,000 garment factory workers who took to the streets for a sixth straight day to demand better wages. In the Gazapur Industrial District just outside of Dhaka, thousands of others also protested amid frustration over higher commodity prices, rent, and other bills. In both Dhaka and Gazapur, about 300 factories employing thousands of workers remain closed. Bangladesh is the second largest garment producing country in the world after China, with its nearly 3,500 factories. Some 4 million workers are employed in them, most women.
According to the Bangladesh Garment Manufacturers and Export- Exporters Association, or BIGMIA, the workers get 8300 takas, or $75 as a monthly minimum wage, and they often need to work overtime to make ends meet. Nazmul Hassan Feroz, additional deputy police commissioner at Palabi and Dhaka's Mirpur area, said police disperse the workers peacefully <clears throat> using tear gas as they block the streets and vandalize some factories. He cl- declined to say whether anyone was injured in the action, but that the protesters threw rocks at security officials who used armored vehicles to roam the streets. Nothing says peace like an armored vehicle. Bangladesh has maintained stable growth for years, but rising inflation has become a major challenge, especially for the poor and the middle class. Sounds familiar. Well, that brings us to the end of our broadcast period for the day and the week. And you know, Netroots Radio does broadcast on, and we will. We're going to meet up here on Monday, indeed, for River City Hash Mondays. So do stay tuned to Netroots Radio all day, all night, and all weekend for all the breaking news as it breaks. And we will meet up here on Monday, right here, in West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy. Je voudrais du soleil vert, des dentelles et des tiers. Des photos de bord de mer, de mon jardin d'hiver. Je voudrais de la lumière, comme en Nouvelle-Angleterre. Je veux changer d'atmosphère, de mon jardin d'hiver. Je voudrais du frais d'Aster Revoir un latte coer Je voudrais toujours te plaire Dans mon jardin d'hiver Je veux déjeuner par terre Comme au long de golfe clair T'embrasser les yeux ouverts Dans mon jardin d'hiver Dans mon jardin d'hiver Dans mon jardin d'hiver Dans mon jardin d'hiver